let me turn off my volume here. <laughs> Have this uh, feedback thing. But anyway, so let me let me start over again. So I'd like to welcome Lance uh, Williams from Confluence Research. And so Lance is a dear friend who we first met in person at the very first uh, Advanced Propulsion and Energy Conference at MIT. And uh, he uh, joined us there and has joined us every year. And uh, we have been, I would say, collaborating together in, in thinking about things. And he's been teaching me a lot about gravity with a lot of patience. Uh, it's not my forte. And also, I, you know, as I've said already, um, you know, I just really applaud Lance for working on the ideas, but then putting them out there uh, in journals and other places for people to comment on, to start collaborations with, to provide comment on, and it's just really to be, um, you know, it's the way things should be done, and, and he's really instilled that thinking in me as well. So um, anyway, further ado, uh, welcome Lance, and he's going to talk about his work on the Kaluza scalar charge. And I will mute so that I... Yeah, thank you, Charles. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're, you're been a great friend as well, and you've taught me a lot. And so it's been a great collaboration. Uh, and I hope we have more good things ahead. Um, so anyway, yes, um, I will be talking about uh, the last bit of work we did under uh, the DARPA grant where we evaluated two different propellantless propulsion theoretical frameworks. Uh, one was the uh, so-called inertial induction that uh, we talked about with Jim Woodward, uh, coupling to the gravitational field of the universe. But the other one was this uh, Kaluza theory uh, that, that is the only classical theory that unifies uh, general relativity and electromagnetism. And I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and then I will go to slideshow. So can you guys see uh, my screen okay? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, and I have uh, 45 minutes. Is that right, Charles? Just double checking, yeah. Yeah, 45 minutes and then 15 minutes of uh, discussion afterwards. Okay. Yeah, this is the last, uh, we, we wrote eight papers uh, on the uh, eight peer-reviewed papers, eight published peer-reviewed papers on uh, over the course of that project over two years. And this is the last one. I haven't presented these results. Uh, and this, is, this was done with uh, a graduate student in, here in Colorado Springs and also a researcher in Germany. Uh, I, I'm forgetting exactly uh, which town in Germany he's in right now. Um, anyway, so this will be about a Kaluza scalar charge. And uh, contrary to what George was saying, I really won't go over the force experiments. Uh, George put up our paper uh, on the null result and everything is captured there. So I won't be talking about that. I'll be going on and discussing new results in the Kaluza theory. Um, now, this is a favorite slide, which, which I always use to start my uh, discussion. Um, let me get this out of the way. Uh, this is I used to start my introduction to scalar fields. Um, there are three classical force fields uh, that we envisage in nature, um, a vector field, a tensor field, and a scalar field. And the difference is uh, how they behave under a coordinate transformation. Um, and I've noted that the scalar field is missing. We have not found a classical scalar field in nature. Uh, there is the Higgs field. That's a quantum scalar field. There is the inflation field. Uh, that is not observed today. Uh, so we, uh, unlike electromagnetism and gravity, which are out there in the universe for us to observe, we haven't found a scalar field. Uh, the vector field is electromagnetism. The tensor field is gravity. 
So it's odd that the scalar field is missing. And so I have this quote from Robert Dickey, who spent a lot of time thinking about scalar fields and did a lot of really interesting work circa 1960 as part of his investigation of the theories of gravity. And uh, Dickey felt that the scalar field must be out there. It's very odd that the vector and the tensor field would be there, but the scalar field, the simplest of the three would not exist. So I take this as an article of faith that there is a scalar field out there for us to find. Now there are different scalar field theories. I, I have done a lot of work on the Kaluza uh, field theory. As I mentioned, it's the only successful unified field theory of, of uh, general relativity and classical electromagnetism. And it comes at the expense of an additional scalar field. So if we want to unify gravity and electromagnetism in the elegant way of the Kaluza theory, then a scalar field becomes mandatory. Um, I've written the Lagrangian for this theory. I know uh, not everyone reads Lagrangians, but it's the most uh, succinct uh, and compact way to express everything about the field theory. And uh, you can see there's two terms there. There's a gravitational term, which is uh, highlighted in blue. And then there's an electromagnetic term, which is shown in yellow. The scalar field multiplies each of them, but to different powers. And so to that extent, it behaves like a variable gravitational constant and simultaneously as a variable electric constant. Um, a lot of work has been done on scalar fields of the form of the first term, but, very, but not a lot of work has been done where the scalar field is coupling in this strange way into both gravity and electromagnetism. So this is just, uh, just to show you that the structure of the theory that we're looking at here, this is a particular scalar field theory, one that I feel is the most compelling and elegant. Um, and now here's what George had mentioned. Uh, the, the test George did in the lab uh, is sort of indicated schematically here uh, from some earlier theoretical results from last year. I found that, that we could have a scalar field around planets uh, generated by the mass of the planet. And so I've indicated a planet in blue with M for the mass and phi for the scalar field. And there's a scalar force, which I've shown on the top left and a, the gravitational force on the bottom left. And you can see uh, the way I've written that, that they both uh, you know, depend on the gradient of M over R in the usual way. Uh, but the scalar field here depends on the square of electric charge divided by the mass. And if the scalar potential is positive, if it's a hill around the planet, then, we, then a charged body should feel a repulsive outward force from the scalar field opposite to the inward gravitational force. And I've shown those with the, the green and the blue arrows. Now, as George mentioned, uh, we went into the lab and we didn't find this force for the range of parameters we investigated. And uh, we wrote up these results in the paper George mentioned, uh, no result effect a no result test on an effect uh, of on weight from electric charge. And you can read about that. That was published in MDPI physics. So we did not find this force. Uh, and I want to now go a little deeper and consider the nature of scalar charge. Um, in a paper which is shown on the bottom uh, from 2020, long range scalar forces in 5D general relativity, uh, I made these identifications of the three types of charge, mass, which is gravitational charge, electric charge, and scalar charge. I identified the electric charge uh, with uh, simply as Q, uh, but really uh, there is a, a, uh, a Lorentz invariant, a constant, that emerges in the theory, and I presume that that must be electric charge. And if so, then the scalar charge has the Q squared over mass dependence shown in equation 20. Now I would like to relax that assumption and go a little more deeply to try and investigate what we mean by a scalar charge. 
And the results that I will present were published uh, in this paper here, uh, new for physical parameterizations of monopole solutions and the role of negative scalar field energy. Uh, this is with Yaroslav Belitsky, who's a graduate student at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Uh, Detlef Hoyer, uh, who is in Germany. Um, and again, I can't quite recall uh, which city in Germany will come to me. Uh, Anatoly Pinchuk is Yaroslav's thesis advisor. And uh, I was the corresponding author on the paper. So these uh, results you can find captured in this paper if you care to look at it. Um, so what we wanna do is investigate this idea of a Kaluza monopole. And by a Kaluza monopole, I mean an object uh, that has three charges. It has mass, it has electric charge, and then it has this mysterious scalar charge. And the way we investigate uh, these, these uh, animals is by examining the vacuum solutions to the field equations. So we are sort of, let's say if, if our uh, monopole is spherical, uh, like a baseball or a bowling ball, we actually solve the vacuum equations outside of it. And, and that's how we determine these solutions. And then the integral constants in the vacuum equations give us either the mass, the electric charge, or the scalar charge. So this is what I mean by a Kaluza monopole. And now I will go on and discuss uh, the various types and permutations of monopoles that one can consider. I want to start with the, what I'll call the Schwarzschild monopole or the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, and of course, this is a standard result. Uh, the Schwarzschild solution is an exact solution to the field equations of general relativity. And I've written the field equations uh, in the dotted box here, where you have the Einstein tensor equated to a source. And the source is just a delta function at the origin. So we, uh, you know, we're basically taking vacuum, <coughs> vacuum solutions here g mu nu equals zero everywhere. This is a vacuum solution around a singularity. And I've written the two potentials, GTT and GRR, that are the solutions, that are the standard Schwarzschild solution. And uh, due, to the, due to the high degree of symmetry, the 10 components of the metric tensor reduce to just these two components here, which I call TT and RR, uh, and that's standard nomenclature. And they both have the same, uh, the same parameter, uh, 2GM over RC squared, where R is distance from the origin, and M is the mass of the central object, G is the gravitational constant, and C is the speed of light. And if we take the, uh, the weak field limit of the Schwarzschild solution, we'll get uh, Newton's law of gravity. So this is just uh, a benchmark, a framework just to tie back to existing theory. This is what we know to be the, uh, the, the gravitational potentials of a single uh, monopole of mass M. Now we wanna go on and consider the Reisner-Nordstrom solution, the electrovacuum solution. And again, this is also an exact solution to the field equations of general relativity. In addition to a massive source at the origin, we also have an electromagnetic uh, field tensor, and that's written as T E M sub mu nu. So the the uh, the the energy momentum tensor of the electromagnetic field uh, has ten components. The time-time component is going to be the energy density. So what we have here is uh, our vacuum solution is now threaded with electric field. So, and the electric field has energy. And so that will contribute uh, to the effective mass of the Kaluza monopole, or I mean of the Reisner-Nordstrom monopole. Um, and so I've written the two potentials here. For the rest of this, I'm going to ignore 
the RR component of the gravitational potential, we'll just keep in mind that there are two gravitational potentials here, but the time-time component is the more interesting one. And so that's the one uh, that we'll be carrying forward and comparing between solutions. But we can see in the time-time component, we have our usual Schwarzschild piece. And then there is a piece uh, that depends on the electric field. And the electric field depends on the charge in the usual way, Q squared over R squared. Uh, so the, and also this A sub T, this is the time component of the electromagnetic vector potential. This is the, the Coulomb potential, if you will. I'm calling it A, a uh, to the A with the uh, superscript T to indicate it's the time component of a four vector. And so it has the usual form uh, Q over R. So the quantity A is the just the electrostatic potential, which depends on charge. In the gravitational potential, the, uh, the electric field contributes with an opposite sign to the mass. So where, whereas the mass is, uh, is, a, is uh, attractive and is a negative potential, uh, the electric charge energy, the energy from the electric field threading space is positive. So it's, it's, it's a hill around the, uh, around the mass, uh, a potential hill, if you will. And also we'll note that the electric field energy goes like one over R squared. And it's easy to show that this Q squared over R, this is the effective mass uh, of the of the electric field inside any radius R. So with the Reisner-Nordstrom solution, you can actually set the mass to zero and you still have a solution just from the electric field. If we can imagine a massless charge, then this would be the gravitational field of the massless charge. It would go like one over R squared. So this is a, uh, another baseline for consideration. So we know the Schwarzschild solution is the mass, uh, is, is the uh, gravitational potential of a, of a monopole of mass M. And then the Reisner Nordstrom gives us the uh, electric potential and gravitational potentials for an object with the mass M and electric charge Q. So that's standard, uh, standard general relativity. Uh, and as I said, the electric field is contributing to the effective mass at infinity. If you integrate this out, even with a zero mass monopole here, you're going to have a finite effective mass. And in fact, uh, you know, an object in orbit around this body really can't tell what the effective mass is made of. Uh, dynamical measurements can't tell you if it's real mass at the center or just electric field inside the sphere. So now I want to present uh, an existing solution to the Kaluza field equations that, that, that is already out there. This is the solution by Davidson and Owen. And they sought the vacuum solution for a monopole which has mass M and scalar charge. So it's electrically neutral and they are just allowing scalar charge. And here, again, I'm considering only the time-time component of the gravitational potential. And now the quantity phi, this is the scalar potential, the potential for the scalar field. And we see that um, both potentials depend on the mass. And now I'm using the quantity M tilde to absorb all of the constants. So in our previous solution, GM over RC, GM over C squared, now I'm just calling GM over C squared M tilde. So the units of M tilde are a length scale and these are unitless and I'll be using the tilde variables from here on out. So the interesting thing about the Davidson and Owen solution is that the, 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 both the gravitational potential and the scalar potential depend on the mass. 
and they come in uh, with different signs. And also there is this constraint, the parameters alpha and beta are free parameters, they're constants. If we wanted to get the right, uh, get the Schwarzschild limit, we would have to set beta to zero. And so uh, in, in the limit that beta is zero, scalar charge vanishes and we recover the, the Schwarzschild solution. If we want to allow a non-zero scalar charge and have beta move away from zero, then uh, alpha must decrease. And so we get a reduction, we start to get a deviation from the uh, gravitational potential. So adding the scalar field apparently makes the gravitational field weaker. Um, and that's, uh, that's strange behavior. Also in these solutions, now I have these additional terms. This means of order one over R squared. So we no longer get uh, these nice exact solutions. Now our Schwarzschild limit with the 2m over R are just the leading terms in a Taylor series. And so we have, uh, we in our paper, we take it to third order, but for simplicity, I'm just stopping at second order as I show these solutions. So we not only have a deviation from the Schwarzschild solution, a reduction in the effective mass, but we also have some other terms out here, other terms in expansion. Uh, so this is already, we're starting to see kind of unusual behavior from the scalar field. So uh, the takeaway here is that neutral bodies do have scalar charge, but that charge must vanish in the Schwarzschild limit. That's what we learned from the Davidson and Owen solution to the Kaluza vacuum equations. Uh, next, I want to show the Lew and Wesson solution, which now are the vacuum solutions uh, for the full Kaluza equation. So we have gravitational, electromagnetic, and scalar. And uh, let me start with the gravitational potential. Again, notice uh, I've got a Taylor series here, so there are higher order terms that I haven't written down, but the series is convergent. Um, so we can see our first term, we have our Schwarzschild term. Uh, and then we also have our Reisner Nordstrom term, the Q squared over R squared. And I'll say here that Q tilde is also a pure length scale. And I'll just go back to show you that it's going to be the, the uh, square root of G over the square root of four pi epsilon naught C squared. So Q tilde is a length scale uh, that involves G and the electric constant. <clears throat> so. So at leading order, the, the Lew and Wesson, it appears to have the right behavior for the Schwarzschild solution. <clears throat> and it also has the, the right behavior for the electrostatic energy contributing to the effective mass. And now at third order or one over R cubed, we get a, a Q to the fourth over M. And actually, that is a typo. That should be Q squared over M. I'm sorry, I have a typo there. Not Q to the fourth, Q squared. Oh, wait, no, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, that is right. It is Q to the fourth uh, over MR cubed. So the whole thing is dimensionless. So we, unlike the uh, Davidson and Owen solution, uh, which I will show quickly, uh, which, which seems to show that the total energy goes like one over R for a neutral body. For a charged body, now the scalar field is down at uh, one over R cubed. So that was a bit of a puzzle. Um, the, uh, looking uh, at the middle line, here is the electrostatic potential. It has the usual form Q over R plus other terms in a Taylor expansion. And then the scalar potential, the bottom line, uh, has Q squared over M. And this is, uh, in the Lew and Wesson solution, Q squared over M is what we would identify with the scalar charge. And that's also the identification that I made in my papers, and it's pretty standard. 
And so what you see here is that the mass of the body is independent and the charge of the body is independent. The scalar charge depends on those two. So if I know the mass, I know the electric charge, then the scalar charge is determined. But yet this does not match the, uh, it doesn't really match the Davidson and Owen solution because if I set Q equal to zero, electric charge to zero to try to get back to the Davidson and Owen solution here, um, I kill off everything. There's no scalar potential and there's no contribution to energy. So the Lew and Wesson solution is somehow inconsistent with the Davidson and Owen solution. Davidson and Owen tell us that a neutral body should have a scalar field and should have a scalar potential. And the energy should go like one over R. But instead, uh, the Lew and Wesson solution says that if we set the charge to zero, then all of the scalar field effects vanish. Um, and we also have a divergence with this M in the denominator. If we tried to set the mass to zero, like for a Reisner-Nordstrom solution, then the scalar potential diverges and the energy uh, also diverges in the gravitational potential. So, so these were some puzzles at the heart uh, that motivated our work on considering scalar charge. So this apparent inconsistency in, in you know, trying to find the scalar charge for a neutral body versus a charged body. So, uh, and I've summarized those here. So there's no apparent scalar field energy in the gravitational field in the Lewin Wesson solution. And there's no scalar field for neutral bodies as in the Davidson and Owen solution. And the scalar charge diverges at zero mass. So somehow these two solutions are not consistent with each other, even though they should be in the limit that charge goes to zero. So uh, we ask, you know, can we, find solutions with sensible neutral limits? And can we make a adequate treatment of scalar energy in the gravitational field? You know, what's going on here? So this is, this is the motivation for our work. So I'd like to show you uh, our a general solution class, which we called class A. And in fact, we found, I think, 30 of these, 30 different classes, different parameterizations. These can be mapped back to the Lew and Wesson solution. Uh, so in some sense, they are a reparameterization. But uh, we have different physical meaning with the solutions I'm going to present here. And so again, this we're going to call this our class A solution. So we. We have the field equations, we're, we're finding the vacuum equations, we have mass M, charge Q, scalar charge S. And now what we do is we set the, the energy, uh, the potential, the energy and the gravitational potential to a constant A, and we set the scalar charge to a constant B. And so that's why I've indicated independent. And what we find is that now the electric charge is the dependent variable. So if we assume that the, uh, the, gravi the gravitational charge, i.e. the mass is an independent number A, and that the scalar, the scalar charge is an independent number B to try and fix these consistency problems with Davidson and Owen versus Lew and Wesson, then we find that the, uh, it's the electric charge which is dependent on them. And we see that the, uh, the gravitational potential has the form we would like. There's an A over R and then a one over R squared for electrostatics. So it looks pretty good. And let me take a particular class A solution which we investigated in the paper and what we found is that we can imagine that the, uh, there is a contribution to scalar charge here that depends on mass. Um, so by, by adopting this form where we have the usual Q squared over M and the scalar charge and then adding a mass term, 
we can start to get back to the Davidson and Owen solution. And that was the motivation for in our class A solutions, choosing these values of A and B. So we set A to be the mass and we set B to be uh, to kind of be a linear combination of the Lou of Lou and Wesson scalar charge and the Davidson and Owen scalar charge to try and reconcile the, these contradictions between those two solutions. And so what you see is that the uh, the gravitational potential now has the has a a Reisner Nordstrom form plus an m squared over r squared contribution uh, to the energy from the scalar field. And it's also repulsive. It has the opposite sign to the gravitational charge, the 2m over r. And then again, we have other terms in the Taylor expansion. Um, when we look at the electrostatic potential, uh, we see now uh, a curious thing that the electric field depends not only on the electric charge, but on the mass. And this, the quantity alpha is just a constant that we've introduced. It's different than the Davidson and Owen constant. So don't get confused by that. Um, but uh, we wanted to allow any, any uh, multiple of the of the, the actual mass of the central body. And then in the, the, scale, the uh, scalar field potential in the bottom line, we have something that looks like Davidson and Owen in the neutral limit. If we set electric charge to zero, now we get a Davidson and Owen scalar potential that depends on the mass. Um, it's different in the gravitational potential because in the gravitational potential it comes as m squared over r squared, but in the in the in the scalar potential it has the Davidson and Owen form of m over r. And again, all of these are the leading terms in a Taylor expansion. There are other terms which may be adding or subtracting to these leading terms. So. So we have a sort of an interesting result here by getting closer to a set of solutions that allow consistency between the neutral body Davidson and Owen solution and the, the fully charged uh, Lou and Wesson solution. Uh, we, we have the possibility of electric charge around neutral bodies. And this M squared is going to be relatively small. As we know, fundamental charges, electrons and protons are very large compared to the mass in unitless dimensions. So these uh, neutral body electric fields are quite weak. And I think when I discussed with George the possibility, George Hathaway, the possibility of trying to measure electric fields around a neutral body that were this weak, uh, there, there are complications. So I, I think it might be possible that we could have uh, uh, possibly electric fields generated by neutral bodies. So the implications of the class A solution is that we do get a non-zero scalar charge for neutral bodies, which matches Lou and Wesson, but it seems to imply that neutral bodies can generate weak electric fields. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, George has suggested this would be very difficult to measure because electric fields are tough to measure and it's tough to isolate them and, and everything is coupled to, you know, mirror charges appear and so on. So it's a difficult measurement and I don't know if it's possible uh, to measure or, or I should say it is possible to measure electric field. The question is, what is the weakest electric field that we could measure in the lab? And this might be a thread for Martin to follow as he continues his work on coupling between electromagnetism and gravity, which I understand, Martin, you said is your, your sort of latest thrust of research. So I would propose uh, electric fields around neutral bodies might be something to investigate. When I think about it at atomic scale, how this is going to change atomic physics. Uh, I haven't done uh, detailed calculations or 
considered lamb shifts or other other things like that. But my intuition is that this whole thing, you know, the electric field from the mass of an electron or the mass of an ion is going to be swamped by van der Waal forces or the dipole moments like a water molecule is going to have a dipole moment. It might be impossible to distinguish at the atomic scale as well. But uh, that I also put that out there for experimentalists to consider if there would be a way to measure or to infer electric fields uh, from neutral molecules inherently, you know, separate from the from the dipole moments that might arise. So I think we would be talking, uh, you know, the elements at the end of the periodic table where all the orbitals are full and everything is spherical. Uh, the noble gases. So, so the takeaway of these class A solutions is we must contemplate weak electric fields around neutral bodies if we want to get some measure of consistency between the known solutions of the Kaluza field equations. Okay, um, we also investigated uh, another class of solutions, which I call class B. Um, and again, our monopole has mass, electric charge, and scalar charge. And what we did here was we said, okay, we want to uh, set the contribution to the gravitational potential to be two independent variables. So A would be, for example, the mass, the, the gravitational charge, and B would be the contribution to the energy from the scalar charge. And in this way, we match the one over R dependence of Davidson and Owen, and we have an A minus B. So we get a difference like we saw in Davidson and Owen, where if you allow scalar charge, then it diminishes the apparent uh, mass of the central object. At leading order, we get our one over R squared, which seems to behave okay. And then we get a complex uh, expression for the scalar charge. So, so the, the gravitational charge and the contribution of the scalar charge to the gravitational mass are taken as the independent variables. And now our, our electric charge and our scalar charge are the dependent variables. And we took a, a particular solution here, which we call the class B solution. Um, and once again, it starts to look like the Davidson and Owen solution. You recall that uh, in the Lewin Wesson, we had Q squared, Q to the fourth over MR cubed. Now we have our Q squared over M back again, but proportional to one over R. So now this thing is behaving like a Davidson and Owen solution. And we also have our Reisner Nordstrom electric field contribution to the energy density, the Q squared over R squared. The uh, electric potential has the nominal Q over R form. And the scalar field uh, looks like this. Now, the scalar charge. Uh, again, since it's a difference, we now have the possibility of either sign uh, in the scalar potential. In the previous solutions, the scalar potential had a negative sign. Here we allow the possibility that the scalar potential could be positive if uh, Q squared over 2M is greater than 2M. So, uh, that is an interesting thing. This is the first solution that seems to allow for either sign in the scalar potential. So the scalar field energy in the gravity, we now have scalar field energy in the gravitational field, uh, but it does vanish with the mass and the scalar potential can now be positive. We do have our problem of uh, a divergence uh, where the mass is in the denominator, setting the mass to zero uh, creates a divergence. Uh, but we have, uh, this is the price we pay to get to the 
Davidson and Owen solution. So the implications of these B class solutions is that we do recover the Davidson and Owen neutral limit with the one over R contribution to scalar field energy. Uh, but the end, and another feature is that the scalar field potential can take on positive values, a hill around the mass, if you will, in potential space, but the total energy becomes negative. And that is because in, in this gravitational potential, if Q squared over 2M is greater than 2M, giving us a positive potential for the scalar potential, giving us a positive value for the scalar potential, then the whole thing flips. And, and this, uh, our gravitational potential behaves like it has a negative mass. So, so the puzzles still keep unwinding as we move through this. Um, we, we're sort of able to recover some nice features and make some reconciliation with Davidson and Owen and Lou and Wesson, but, but we now are starting to encounter the possibility of negative mass, if you will, or repulsive gravity, if you will. So low mass bodies can have negative energy and positive scalar potentials. And by low mass, I mean the Q squared over M is greater than 2M. If, we, if M goes to infinity, then this behaves like a normal Reisner Nordstrom or Davidson and Owen. But if M gets very small, things start to flip. So we have a suggestion that there might be some strange behavior around low mass bodies. Low mass electrically charged bodies seem to uh, have some odd gravitational characteristics, at least according to these solutions. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, what is the fundamental relation between these different charge parameterizations and why are they doing this? And, and why can't we get all of these solutions to hang together? Well, what we found, and, and I think this was a, a new result published in our paper, uh, it was not known by Davidson and Owen or Lewin Wesson, is that uh, there is zero total energy total in the electromagnetic field and the scalar field. So I've written here to the right of the arrow, the uh, gravitational field equations that we were solving. Uh, and, and what we see is that the Einstein tensor is equated to the sum of the uh, energy momentum tensor of the scalar field shown in blue, plus the energy momentum of the electromagnetic field shown in yellow. And what we find is that they're, they're exactly negative, they cancel, so that this sum is actually zero. That's what's shown in the box. And so if the electromagnetic field energy density uh, shown as the time time component here is taken to be positive, which is standard, then it implies that the electro that the scalar field energy density must be negative. These are going to have opposite signs. And this is a general feature of these monopole solutions that was apparently not known uh, before our work. And I think it explains a lot of what's going on. Now, it sort of makes sense because to the left of the arrow, we have a five dimensional field equation. This is the nature of the Kaluza theory. You're, you're actually just solving Einstein equations in five dimensions and the vacuum equations in five dimensions are zero on the right hand side. So when, when you collapse down or project down into four dimensions uh, and you recover an electromagnetic energy tensor, uh, energy momentum tensor and a scalar energy momentum tensor, uh, it sort of makes sense to me, you know, thinking about it retrospectively that these things would sum to zero. If, if the Kaluza theory is correct and the electromagnetic gravitational or scalar field are unified in the way predicted by the theory, 
than the electromagnetic energy density and the scalar field energy density are equal and opposite. So, so what we have is a situation where uh, that the electric fields uh, in this theory ride on a negative energy scalar field. So it's sort of like an iceberg, I think. And, and maybe the tip of the iceberg is the electric field, and that's the one we see, but the whole thing is floating on a negative energy scalar field. Uh, and so that the total energy of this thing is zero. Now, the, the Reisner-Nordstrom solution, you know, has an effective mass at infinity from the electric field. This would seem to indicate that if there is an electric field at infinity, it must be compensated by a scalar field. And so that a massless, uh, a massless charged object, a Reisner Nordstrom massless charged object really would have zero mass at infinity because of the counteracting contribution of the uh, scalar field. So, you know, this depends on the, on you know, whether the, we believe the Kaluza theory, uh, but if we do, this is a, a distinct prediction of the Kaluza theory that uh, negative energy scalar fields must accompany positive energy electric fields. And I'm not sure what the implications of that are totally, but here are a few. Um, this does explain why the Davidson and Owen neutral solution has less total mass than a source shield monopole. And I'll go back and show you that real quick. Um, let's see. Here it is. So this is the Davidson and Owen solution. As I said, if you allow scalar charge, uh, if you allow beta to be non-zero, then the effective mass starts to decrease here. So this, so this feature that we're seeing, you know, the, the fact that the electromagnetic energy and the scalar field energy uh, sum to zero explains why the Davidson and Owen effective mass is less than the Schwarzschild shield limit than the source shield solution. Um, it also implies that electric fields always accompany negative energy scalar fields. So uh, you know, this, is, this is my stopping point. And I guess uh, I didn't take so long on this. We'll have a lot of time for discussion, but uh, it seems to suggest a new way to generate negative energy. You know, can we generate negative energy through the manipulation of electric fields? Uh, or are these things tied to could never partition them? Uh, our only way to generate, our only way to detect negative energy uh, summed with the electric field would be to have a massless charged object and look at the gravitational interaction of that massless charged object and see if it had zero, if a, if a charged object had zero mass at infinity. So that's what I mean by partition. It's not clear that these things can ever be partitioned. And it's not clear to me or, you know, where we left it in the paper that this is not just a, a bookkeeping exercise or something imaginary, but the you know the uh, a the fact of negative energy in the scalar field seems an inescapable consequence of the Kaluza theory. So I would like to uh, thank my co-authors, uh, you know Detlef Hoyer. Um, he, he trained us uh, on how to find these solutions. Uh, they're all found numerically using MATLAB and MAPLE. Uh, and then once uh, the technique was in hand, Yaroslav Belitsky uh, found you know, 30 odd solutions or reparameterizations. So um, 
that concludes my talk. I know that was kind of short, Charles, but uh, but that's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lance. No, that's not short, actually. Uh, let me look at, you're supposed to end at 2.15 and it's 2.21. Oh. So, uh, and then discussion from 2.15 to 2.30. So I think that was perfect. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, um, So I didn't quite understand. Uh, can you go back to your uh, your last chart? Yeah. This one? Yeah. So what do you mean by partition them? I didn't quite gather that. Yeah, it means, you know, could we ever separate them? Um, OK. You know, could we ever distinguish them? So I'm saying, you know, you know, can we generate negative energy th through the manipulation of electric fields somehow? Uh, you know, because we talk about other ways to generate negative energy, like uh, maybe Casimir stuff uh, or something like that. You know, it's in, uh, you know, it's just sort of in the zeitgeist of discussion of these exotic effects. Right. But I'm wondering, could, could we ever separate it out? So let's say that, uh, that uh, the Coulomb field always has a negative energy component in the scalar field. How would we find that? How would we detect it? Uh, you know, could we pull it out and just get the pure negative energy somehow? Or are these things always tied together? And it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like the Dirac uh, C, you know, for antimatter, Dirac's idea of antimatter. You know, he started finding negative masses, and then he said, "Oh, wait a minute, this is antimatter," and you know, and, there, and there's this hole in the Dirac C and that sort of thing. That was how he was able to get around it. I wonder if something like this is possible here, where we can actually get, you know, isolate that negative energy scalar field somehow. Right. Yeah. Something I've, you know, I, I guess. I think it's really powerful, the argument about, you know, we see tensor fields and gravity, we see vector fields and EM, where's the scalar field, right? And yeah. so that, you know, and hey, nature should, uh, should provide that. But then if it's a scalar, it has no direction associated with it, right? And so would it just be the same in every direction and therefore make it hard to uh, detect is that is that does that make sense <laughs> that question no, I, yeah i think you know like uh, the newtonian gravitational potential is also a scalar and of course uh you know every every concentration of mass is is making this so we can detect it it's not the same in every direction if you have a localized concentration of mass or electric charge in this case. So you would have still to have uh, things that were generating different scalar fields. Yes. And yes. then detect the difference in the scalar fields between those two. Yes, yeah. So does that, does that enter into the, uh, you know, the charge experiment that you did? Did you, might you actually need two charge bodies? Well, um, you know, this was part of our motivation, uh, or, or I'm saying part of my motivation for digging into this, because our experiment relied on a positive potential, a positive scalar potential, you know, to push outward from the planet. Let me see here. Let me put that picture up. Um, this guy. So, you know, our, the force that we looked for in George's lab relied on a positive uh, scalar potential. And, and now that we understand, you know, perhaps that positive potential implied a mass to charge ratio, uh, you know, maybe that explains it. And, and we did note in that paper, um, I did a, a sort of a survey of all these types of experiments these so-called electrogravitic experiments, and I parameterized them all. And I found that our experiment, you know, George's experiment, we looked at the biggest range of a certain dimensionless parameter of any other experiments. 
but our experiment and all the others were in a certain regime of this parameter. And I think uh, the suggestion is maybe we can find this effect if we looked you know, around smaller masses. Uh, now it doesn't help us with planets, planets are big masses, um, but perhaps this effect, you know, a positive scalar potential is limited to some uh, set parameter space uh, of mass and electric charge. Yeah. Um, just one other quick question. Uh, you know, the work you did with the, the parameterization and you found 30 different solutions and then a Sounds like you explored in depth two of them, A and B. What about the others? Are they not uh, worth exploring or what? Yeah, I judge them to be non-physical. Uh -huh. uh, like, like they had different signs in the metric. So for example, you know, it, like our, our metric is, is say plus, 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 minus, you know, where the space dimensions have all the same signature and then time has the opposite sign in the metric or in the Minkowski metric. We were getting, you know, Yaroslav found, you know, where it was two plus two or, or things were flipped, you know, time was like space and space was like time. We had a bunch of them that, that seemed to be non-physical and that was why I ruled them out. I see. Yeah, these, these two, the A and the B seem to be the only physically meaningful ones in, in my view. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions? Well, I know there's been a little chat um, from Eric has an idea. Um, and uh, Zuni as well. I don't know if you if you folks want to make some comments. No, well, I've got a quick question if sure. Possible, yeah. Um, Lance, in the various solutions that you're given, uh, giving uh, the gravitational potential, the electric charge, and the, the scalar charge, uh, you mentioned that the first one, the gravitational, when you took it out to several terms, it converged. Did the other two converge as well? Uh, the uh, uh, those terms, and the electric charge and the uh, the scalar charge, did they converge as well? Yes. Yeah, they are convergent. Um, you know, depending. Uh, if, if that mass parameter uh, is, is not divergent itself, let me make yeah. that clear. That Q squared over M, assuming the M is not zero, um, but, but these are a convergent series. Okay. Um, but but it, you know, these extra terms in the series are not meaningless. You know, we're actually getting away from the standard Reisner, Nordstrom, and, and Schwarzschild solution because this everything is held at zero energy. So that's what's happening with these higher order terms. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, so from my studies, my, my point of view, I'm taking the scalar field and the scalar effect to be the fact that like you're, the planet is rotating. Um, so the at the there's this MHD Dynamos 3M.php site that I put up, and that's the this guy Lathrop has shown that uh, like a rotating body scales uh, fields that are going passing through it. So the um, like if you take and he's trying to apply it to planetary physics. So it's this this rotational dynamic of the sodium sphere is showing a scaling effect of charges applied to it. So we need to take, you know, if we're on a planet that spins and from my perspective, gravity is a spinning force you know, and that needs to be uh, reintegrated into the theory of gravity because um, we know that things spin in the universe. So that's, that's it for me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we didn't assume any motion. Everything is static and time independent, spherically symmetric here. Okay, so it is it's that rotational force of a of a planet, or it's the rotational force of the propulsion field, which creates the scaling effect of uh, charges within it. So that's 
I don't know how to argue it better than that, but just it's simple and we need to incorporate that into modern thinking. So thank you though. Okay. Um, any, any more comments or questions before we move on? And how about the magnetic forces in this oh. equation? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yeah, there is a question I have about, about that. Uh, people, uh, I, I guess uh, you asked if I want to make a comment about what I was saying earlier. And yeah, uh, yeah, uh, just what confuses me if uh, quarks were really electrons and positrons. Uh, is that in nuclear fission, when two hydrogen atoms melt together, they give off a positron and turn into a helium atom with one uh, one neutron. Uh, but if it, but if uh, the two quarks that we see in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom are really just uh, fractional positrons. Then why is it what then uh, when one of those fractional positrons is apparently emitted or I guess we have to be uh, spontaneously generated, but uh, uh, point is why isn't uh, why why does the neutron still have three quarks in its system instead of two if fusion causes it to release at least one of those positrons? But maybe I have the wrong impression of things. Yeah, I think the you know the quark picture is pretty well founded, uh, and they have a complex charge uh, called color charge, where there's three different charges, and that's why the quarks come in three because it takes three to neutral to have a neutral body. But uh, I, I don't think there's any question, you know, that the, the quarks are not electrons or positrons; they're definitely different animals with different coupling and and a whole different type of charge called color charge. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Lance. I appreciate all your work and uh, thinking. It looks like there's some new avenues to explore uh, that would be, that could potentially be fruitful. So let's, let's continue the discussion maybe uh, sometime next week. I'd like to follow up on that. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you.